This is the Disaster Recovery Pro. Welcome back to our video series where we discuss important concepts in disaster recovery and business continuity. In today's video, we're going to take a look at the next phase in the evolution of disaster recovery solutions, which was largely driven by advancements in replication technology and high-speed, long-range network links. Many of the advances in this period were things that could technically have been done before, but because of the improvements in the replication technology and the networks that support it in terms of efficiency and cost effectiveness, these replicated solutions became much more practical and much more commonplace. What this meant is that you could actually maintain a usable point-in-time copy of all your production data at a remote site and keep it up to date in close to real time. You could take this storage and then attach it to standby servers at time of disaster or if you're going to test and bring them up very quickly. And some of these technologies would even allow you to boot your servers from replicated SAND disks, resulting in even faster recovery. This very significantly reduces the overhead and recovery. Your data payload is already there. You don't have to restore it or rehydrate it. You just have to attach it to your target servers. And again, if you can boot from SAN, that results in an even faster recovery because you don't have to recover your operating system from an image or from a tape backup or something along those lines. It's just there and ready to go. There are, of course, limits to this technology. You have to match hardware types very closely and things like that. But when you get it working, it works very well and very quickly. And now because your data already exists at the recovery site and you have a high-speed network connection bridging the two sites, you can have servers on standby, either ready to go, ready to have storage attached, or you can actually have them live and using things like clustering or database log shipping to keep them in sync and have them ready to go at any time. Again, reducing your recovery time for those servers at least from hours or days down to minutes or hours. What all this means is that you can now get RTOs less than 24 hours relatively easily if you're willing to spend the money. And again, the cost effectiveness improvements have made these solutions much more achievable, at least for the more critical portions of your environment. And what you'd see in a lot of larger enterprises is they would use the more expensive replication-based solutions to recover their most critical servers or most critical applications. And they would use slower backup and restore type solutions to recover their lower priority applications and services. So you really start to see a lot more flexibility in how you can define RTOs. And again, that gives a lot of empowerment to the businesses to make those decisions rather than the technology. Your business can say, I want a really short RTO for these critical systems, and the rest of it, if it comes up in 72 hours, we're happy with that. You get that flexibility when you have all these new options for hybrid layered solutions. So the diagram here shows a fairly simple but fairly typical replicated solution. On the left you have your production environment where you'll have one or more storage arrays that's holding the data for your servers. It'll be connected to your live servers usually through a fiber channel sand fabric or iSCSI or similar technology and your live production servers are constantly reading and writing data to and from this set of storage arrays. In the middle of the diagram You'll see we have a network extension. This would typically be a dedicated point-to-point -point link, or it could be a WAN connection like an MPLS cloud. On the right, in the recovery environment, we'll have duplicates of your storage arrays, and we'll use this network link to send data from our production storage array to the recovery storage arrays. To save on bandwidth, typically you would seed these storage arrays on the recovery side with a full data set or as close to it as you can. And when you first spin up your replication, you'll give it some time to allow it to catch up and get in sync with production. And then operationally, you'll only have to be sending over your changes as they happen to the recovery side. Now, when you want to execute a recovery on the recovery side, what you would do is actually set up the host's and the operating systems on them where needed if you're using shared equipment or on-demand equipment. Then you'll have to prepare your storage and present it. This is not a very lengthy process. Basically what this means is you'll pick which snapshot of the storage, we'll get into what that is in a few minutes, and actually map that to the servers that they're supposed to be attached to. At this point we're ready to boot up our recovery servers, 
so they can start using that storage and start up the applications that may be running off of it. If we have any servers that can boot directly from the replicated LUNs, we didn't even have to bother to set up the operating system on them. They can start just from bare metal. If we have servers that are live clusters, that's live servers kept in sync with their production peers, we can either manually fail them over, or if they're set up to automatically fail over, go in and check and make sure that they've failed over properly. Now that we've assured that all of our servers are running, you can go into your database servers, start them up and synchronize them if they're replicated, or if you've got a database server that's kept in sync with something like log shipping, which again we'll examine in a second, you can just start those databases, pick the point in time you want to synchronize them to, and then go right and start your applications and do your testing and validation. And really being able to get to these last three steps, that's starting your databases, starting your applications, and testing and validating, the sooner you can get to those last three steps in this process, the better. And this type of solution lets you get there pretty fast. We really only see overhead in the process involved in setting up the hardware if it needs to be set up on demand and actually going in and doing that little bit of preparation and presentation of the storage to the servers. Just about every modern disk array will allow you to take snapshots of your data at any given point in time. And this is a very powerful tool to have for recovery. If you look at our diagram on the left, we'll have a production array. And in our example, we're showing four disks in green there, A, B, C, and D. In the middle of the diagram, we have our recovery array. And you'll see there's four green disks there, A1, B1, C1, and D1. Those are the disks that are constantly being replicated to from production. So the green copy on the recovery array are the disks that are in sync with the reciprocal disks on the production side. What you'll do on the recovery array is periodically take a snapshot of your replicated disks. That snapshot represents the state of those disks at the point in time when you took the snapshot. So if your production data load is, say, one terabyte, your point in time snapshot will not actually occupy another terabyte on your disk array. It will actually just occupy enough space to record the changes that have happened since the snapshot was taken. The snapshot will grow over time, but it will only get to the full size of the data set if you changed every single bit in that data set. So the amount of unused disk space on your array really determines how many snapshots you can keep and how long you can keep those snapshots for. Also depending on what your rate of data change in your production environment is. This gives you an image of your data that's crash consistent for the point in time when you executed the snapshot. This snapshot may also be application consistent in many cases, meaning that you can start up your applications and just run. It depends on the state of the databases that are included in that snapshot. In many cases, databases will require more granular point in time adjustment to make them usable. What this does is this allows you to tailor the frequency of your snapshots to meet whatever the RPO requirements are. So if the business determines that the maximum data loss that they can withstand is 15 minutes worth of data, then you're going to want to make sure that you're taking your snapshots in 15 minute increments or less. Since you can have multiple snapshots, you can have one or more snapshots that you can fall back to in case your first snapshot is unusable or somehow corrupted. And again, the amount of space you have on the array will determine how many of these snapshots you can keep. Or this can even be driven by business requirements as well. Your business may say, well, we want to be able to go back an entire day's worth of snapshots. In that case, you're going to have to provision your disk array to meet those requirements. So when we map our storage to our recovery servers, what we map is actually going to be the snapshot rather than the original disks. This gives us a little bit of flexibility because, again, we can pick the point in time we want, but we can also have the option to keep replication running while we're doing something like a DR test. If you have to break replication in order to do a DR test, Anytime you do a DR test, you're basically exposing yourself to potential data loss for the duration of the test while your replication is down. So it's nice to have that little bit of extra flexibility. Having efficient and cost-effective network point-to-point -point connections gives you other options for replicated solutions as well, involving clustering or database log shipping. This is where you have the server or application level handle your replication or data synchronization rather than the storage level. In either of these cases, you'll have a live server on either side of the connection 
They'll use various techniques to synchronize data between them. Both servers will be available at any time, and they may need manual intervention to be fully functional on the recovery side, or they may be set to automatically fail over. The example we've charted here is for a database server using log shipping for synchronization. This is fairly typical for database servers as they probably need a more granular ability to pick a point in time than your overall data load for your servers does. This is called log shipping because in order to stay in sync, you basically only have to send over your transaction logs, which is basically a set of logs that allows you to replay the transactions done by your database. You may not be able to keep an infinite number of transaction logs, but you'll be able to keep enough to give you flexibility to pick any point in time that you want as far back as the transaction logs you have will allow. So looking at the diagram, in a typical database server, you'll have a volume that contains the live database and another volume that will contain a set of transaction logs for that database. What you can do is have your database server send its latest transaction logs over to the server on the recovery side periodically. That server on the recovery side will be in standby mode, but it will have enough transaction logs and an already seeded database to be able to roll it forward to any point in time that you want within the set of transaction logs that you're actually keeping. So at time of test or at time of disaster, what you do with that standby host is you'll start up the database, you'll pick your point in time, and roll your database forward through your transaction logs to that point in time. Depending on the exact technology you're using, you may be able to have your database server on recovery side actually automatically apply transaction logs as they come in to a certain point and save a backlog in them in case you have to rewind a little. In the case of a high availability cluster, your server on the production side will have a peer in the recovery side that's kept in sync across this network connection, and they can simply fail over. In other words, stop services on the production side and start the same services on the recovery side in almost real time. In both scenarios, depending on the setup, you can be set up to have an automatic failover happen, where your failover is near instantaneous, maybe a minute or two of downtime while it switches over, or it may require manual intervention, which is usually a very quick process as well, just requires somebody to go in and actually execute the failover. In any case, you reduce all the overhead of having to rehydrate or reattach or do anything on the storage side in order to get your servers up. Also, when you have an efficient point-to-point -point network connection, you can extend any of your networks across this connection, not just the ones you're using for your application. So your servers in the recovery side will have their production connections back out to the rest of your enterprise if you have remote sites or connectivity for outside users. So in this era of recovery, what you see is replication-based solutions that use a combination of storage replication, clustering, database synchronization strategies to achieve really fast RTO and short RPO times. And which solution you use for which part of your environment depends on the exact technology used and what the RTO and RPO requirements for that particular service are. So that's it for our overview of solutions in what I'm calling the replication era. When we come back next time and continue our series, we'll take a look at how virtualization technologies really revolutionized recovery and were a big game changer that pushed the conversation from recoverability to operational resiliency. So thanks for watching today's presentation. If you found this topic interesting and you want to learn more about disaster recovery and business continuity, please go ahead and like the video, leave a comment, subscribe to the channel, and share this video with everybody else. And like we always say here at the Disaster Recovery Pro, hope for the best, but plan for the worst, and have a great day.